Hello. <clears throat> I can I can hear you. Okay. Sweet. I haven't uh full screened my slide deck yet. I think I'll I'll wait till the intros are are done and then I'll full screen mine on my end at that point. Well, you know what? Turns out that we're on right now. So you probably already heard uh, you probably already heard Matt's voice. Here's what's gonna go on. We've been doing this all month, uh, doing some rights management stuff, and uh, we just wanna get into it, do the third one. So let's get started. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I'd like to begin by recognizing that Manitoba Music was founded on Treaty 1 territory, which is the original land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene, Pe Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And I'd like to recognize the strong Inuit community here in Manitoba. Manitoba Music respects the treaty in which our organization resides, and we commit to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of collaboration and reconciliation. My name is Alex Shani. I am the industry coordinator at Manitoba Music. And today we are joined by Matt Gorman of Ocean Town Music. He's a lawyer and a wonderful resource. We've been doing this stuff all month, dealing with rights management. Uh, we had the first two sessions and this is our third session. We're gonna focus right now more on practical uses and applications of this. The, if you need a chance to go back, you can check our websites. We'll have all that information there. So like I said, this is the third and final session of the Music Rights series that has been happening all this month. All the sessions have been streamed live to Facebook and to YouTube, and they're available for you to go back and rewatch if you missed a previous session, or if you just like them so much because you've decided that you need music law more in your life, more uh, take a play, bigger role. We have all that information. These presentations are part of our Music Works lineup. Uh, music Works, they're sessions that are designed to equip artists with the skills and tools and information that they need to help them organize, establish, and grow their music as a business. So like I said before, today we're talking about the practical applications of rights management in the real world. And you can check it all out on our Manitoba Music's manitobamusic.com slash workouts workshops uh, to get the rights management series. Okay, rambling done. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can type them in the live stream and I will make sure to relay them to Matt. But let's get Matt up here and on the screen and we can uh, get to know him a little bit. This is Matt Gorman. You want to talk a bit about yourself before you get into it? Uh, sure, not too much though. Um... Yeah, my name is Matt Gorman. I'm a music lawyer based in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. Um, I love music law. I'm going to have a lot of fun here today. I hope, every, hope everyone does. Um, I've been a musician most of my life. I've been playing drums and piano all my life. And so I think when I became a lawyer, natural progression to eventually uh, do music and entertainment law. I largely work with talent. I do service some publishers and small labels, but 90 plus percent of my practice is really uh, geared towards uh, talent. So artists, uh, songwriters, performers, uh, producers, and uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. That's awesome. Yes. Like I said, this is the third and final in our rights management series. So we're really happy to have Matt Gorman here and he's going to walk us through practical applications of music law. So let's get to it. Sure. And can you see my screen right now? There you go. Now we got it up. Yeah. Got the presentation up. Okay. <clears throat> Great. So, um, so yeah, so this is session number three of the, the rights management uh, series. Certainly recommend that you guys check out the first two, um, which were done by Steve Carroll and, and Byron Pasco. Really, really great information. Um, I think they did a lot of the heavy lifting <laughs> in going through all the uh, the royalties, um, the different collection organizations and societies. Um, really complex <clears throat> terrain. I'll cover that a little bit today, but not so much. And like I say, um, uh, I'm going to really try to focus on sort of the practical applications. Would like to really make this informal. Um, if I talk about something, if there's a question, let's, you know, let's chat about that more than happy if people have questions or if people, you know, have an experience they'd like to share. <clears throat> I'm sure there are a lot of new emerging artists uh, taking part in the session here today and would greatly value from, uh, would greatly benefit and value from uh, hearing about other experiences. Um, you can check me out on Instagram. It's uh, 90 plus percent music stuff, 10 percent 
adorable kid stuff. So good bang for your buck if you want music related content. <laughs> um, also have a Facebook group. I'm not as active there, but I try to be uh, Ocean Town Music, Music Law Discussion. I tend to just post um, some music law tidbits here and there. Um, sometimes just some music industry stuff, music business uh, uh, stuff more generally that I find interesting. And hopefully uh, that's a good resource for folks. Um, email is matt at oceantownmusic.ca. That's my phone number. It's my cell number. I give it out. <laughs> um, call me crazy. But um, but my business generally is 24 seven. If people, if people need me, if people have a, a major issue, you can get in touch with me. Um, so with respect to the agenda, like I said, uh, Byron and Steve did a really great job of, uh, in the first two sessions, strongly recommend that everyone go check out those two sessions if they haven't already. Um, thought I'd start out with <clears throat> some copyright basics. Um, that will, you know, there'd be a little bit of overlap between that and what, um, Steve and Byron, uh, discussed. Uh, potential music agreement red flags. Um, I always like to talk about those when we're talking about the practical uh, within the the music business. But I'd like to go through a few terrifying case studies. These are generally all true case studies from files of mine. I obviously um, don't, you know, I obviously created some fictitious names and some maybe some uh, dramatic effect, <laughs> but otherwise they're uh, true case studies. And I just I think they'd be helpful to kind of go through, break them down a little bit, talk about them and give folks a sense as to what are some of the, the major issues that can pop up um, in the music business. And, and in particular, um, you know, when, when you have contractual relationships and, and music partners out there. And lastly, hopefully we have time for it, but when should I get a music lawyer? I get this question all the time. And again, I think a practical sort of question that, that, uh, that, um, that folks generally have and aren't really sure when to engage a lawyer. So more than happy to, to chat a little bit about that. Awesome. So, um, Sound good to you, Alex? I'll get to it. The sounds part. it sounds great. I'm really I'm really excited. Like I was saying over the last couple of sessions, we got a lot of information in a really short period of time. Um, so this is going to serve as a great recap to kind of touch back on that and maybe a little bit of acronym free uh, examples. Uh, you know what I mean? Just uh, there's we forget often um, about this stuff. So I'm really glad whenever we have an expert. I'm going to actually jump off the screen now and just let you get to it take up all the real estate and share this lovely knowledge with us. Okay, so, great. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Uh, um, so copyright basics, I, I like to go through just a few copyright basics. I mean, there are huge textbooks on copyright. There's no way I'm going to be able to touch on, you know, all of copyright in, in just one slide, let alone a whole hour presentation, because that's that's a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, but something I like to I like to kind of talk about this at the front end, because um, this sort of stuff, you need to kind of get at the front end in order to get most of what follows, particularly when we get into revenue streams. And I'm not going to talk too much about revenue streams. We'll get to this slide. And again, I think Steve and Byron did a good job of going over the acronyms, the revenue streams, the royalties associated with both the musical work and sound recording. We'll get there. Um, but for now, just a few points on copyright more generally. So I always look at copyrights as, as valuable business assets. Um, you know, as a songwriter, as an artist, yeah, you're making, you know, beautiful creative works. But at the end of the day, you're hoping, I think, that they make money. And as a result, they really are a valuable business assets or can be valuable business assets. And I think that perspective is important. Um, what do we mean when we talk about copyright? We're, we're talking about a literary, artistic, dramatic, or musical works under the Copyright Act, um, and including um, sound recordings. Um, uh, and what, do you, what is a copyright? Well, you, well, once you have a copyright, and you, we talked about sort of fixation last time, um, it's once you fix um, you know, a literary, artistic, dramatic, or musical work in tangible form, you get a bundle of rights, which gives the owner the exclusive right to do all of these neat things. And that's, you know, all these things that make money, that is reproduce, produce, perform, make a sound recording, communicate to the public by telecommunication, uh, to make any contrivance that might be mechanically reproduced, etc. From my perspective, the only reason why we're, why, you know, creatives are able to make money from music um, is really, it's based on this piece of paper called the Copyright Act. <laughs> if it weren't for the Copyright Act providing creators with the exclusive right to, um, produce, reproduce, perform, publicly perform, et cetera, um, there really would be no incentive for, for anyone to create anything in a way. Um, so given that we have this copyright regime within the Copyright Act, it gives creatives the exclusive right to do all of these things. And all of these different things here captured within the Copyright Act lead to a different revenue stream. Um, there are lots of different revenue streams and lots of different ways music is consumed. 
And whenever music is consumed in that different way, it triggers a revenue stream. And so it's complex because there's a whole lot of revenue streams out there, but it all kind of originates back to the Copyright Act and these exclusive rights under the Copyright Act. And that's just the, that's the way that I um, uh, think of this and digest it. And I start with that uh, rather than kind of jumping right into the acronyms and, and all that sort of stuff, at least from a legal perspective, that's the way I kind of uh, start. Um, the work must be original and fixed. So, so one aspect of copyright is, yes, you have to, to fix it, absolutely, but it has to be original. And the bar for originality within Canada and the US, but we're gonna focus on Canada here today, it's not an overly burdensome bar. Um, the work doesn't need to be good or necessarily all that creative to be original. It just cannot be copied by, from, um, it, it can't be copied. You can't copy another work, number one. And it can't be such a trivial exercise, the legal language sort of in, in some of the case laws, it can't be such a trivial uh, exercise or the skill and judgment, the skill, the exercise of skill and judgment can't be so trivial that it's kind of deemed just a mechanical exercise, for example. So you need to kind of pass some bar of originality in order to get your copyright to begin with. So just something to note. Um, I don't know if moral rights was touched on last time, maybe it was, but, but, um, the rights that we talked about before, you know, the right to produce, uh, perform, make a sound recording. I look at those as, as a, a creative's economic rights. So those are the those are the rights you're going to hang your hat on to make money. But at the same time, what comes along with those bundle of rights is also moral rights, and that means one's uh, right to the integrity of your work um, and the right to be named in association with your work. And so, you know, for example, if you wrote a song. Um, and you gave a publisher control over that song. And let's just say you didn't waive moral rights because you can waive moral rights, but you can't assign moral rights. We don't need, we don't need to get into that, maybe a little bit too much detail, but let's just say you don't waive moral rights. And then that publisher goes and they take that song and they place it in a particularly graphic, violent scene, for example, or they use, you know, that, um, that song in, you know, a cigarette ad or something like that. Arguably, maybe that triggers uh, one's moral rights and not a whole lot of creatives think about that or maybe are aware of it. But it's, uh, it's worth keeping in mind that it sort of comes with the, this bundle of rights you get um, under the Copyright Act. Um, the author and the owner are different concepts, I think. Um, uh, maybe Stephen Byron did a really good job of talking about that last time. I might be the the um, uh, the author of a work, and um, therefore, as author, I'm the first owner of a song. However, um, I might assign those rights to a publisher, or um, I might assign a recorded piece of uh, a sound recording to a record label, who then might be the controller slash owner um, of uh, of that sound recording. So there are different concepts under a Copyright Act. Um, Song can be a work of joint authorship, um, so obviously two people can can collaborate. Um, we're going to talk about maybe a little bit about co-writer agreements later on, and I know that was touched on last time. But um, more and more folks today are are collaborating when they're writing songs via Zoom. Excuse me, song camps um, not uncommon to have two, three, four uh, plus songwriters uh, associated with a particular song, um, and and as a result, uh, a work of joint authorship is created. Um, copyright lasts a long time. I don't need to get into the the life of the author plus fifty um, or the, uh, the, uh, the the term with respect to sound recordings, but it's 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 a long time. Um, um, you know, so so potentially, if you have a valuable business asset, i.e., a musical work um, or you know even a sound recording, that can potentially make money for for many many um, years and and also potentially for for your estate. Um, multiple revenue streams from sound recording and musical composition. So with that in mind, I think that brings us to this next slide. So I guess to wrap up this slide, that's sort of sort of a few high level key takeaways from my perspective when it comes to copyright basics and maybe lays the foundation for everything else that we're gonna talk about um, later in this presentation. Um, now, obviously, um, with respect to to copyright, there, there's largely, you know, um, uh, two, three buckets that folks focus on. I think the, during the last sessions, there were three buckets. There was the musical work, the sound recording, and uh, uh, neighboring rights or digital performance um, uh, royalties. I've kind of just simplified and uh, just narrowed it down, I guess, to, to two buckets. That is the musical work on the one hand, and then the sound recording on the other hand. Um, we've got two distinct copyrights here. You know, the musical work is the the lyrics, the 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 chord progression, the song structure, um, etc. And the sound recording is the actual master recording. Um, I always give the example of you know, if I'm holding up one of my favorite records, you know, Stevie Wonder's "Songs in the Key of Life." 
um, there's there's um, maybe technically I'm holding up two copyrights in my hand. There's you know there's the uh, uh, the musical work, so the lyrics, the chord progression, uh, the melody, and then there's the actual sound recording, the master recording, um, and um, you know in which that musical work is embodied. The musical work is embodied on that sound recording, and so they're inextricably linked. And a lot of folks think of them as one and the same, but uh, really to understand revenue streams making money from music, all the acronyms that were talked about last time, at a fundamental level, you really need to understand um, this, the fact that there are separate copyrights here. Um, uh, and, you know, depending on how that music is consumed, depending on how that song is used, depending on how that sound recording is used, will dictate the revenue streams, will dictate the money that comes um, uh, to, uh, to the individual or individuals that are, that are entitled to the revenue associated with that uh, with that copyright, um, so I've kind of again made it very simple here, and I think this was touched on last time. But if we're looking to the left side here, the left orange bubble, the musical work, you know, typically what could happen is, um, you know, if I write a song in my basement, strumming a guitar, I record it on my iPhone. All of a sudden, I have a, a musical work copyright. Kind of as simple as that. I don't need to register it with uh, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, although I can. I don't need to. Um, but I, I have a, a copyright, a musical work. Um, if my career starts to blow up, or if I start to get some interest from music publishers, I may enter into a deal with a music publisher, um, whereby I, as as author and an owner of that work, um, thereby assign or or transfer some or all of those rights to a music publisher. Who would then look to exploit that musical work, and there'd be, you know, uh, an associated revenue uh, share uh, split associated with that agreement. Similarly, for a sound recording, the the maker that is under the Copyright Act, that's the the individual or company that makes the arrangements for that sound recording to take place. So the individual or company that you know maybe hires a session musicians, pays for the recording, all that kind of stuff. Um, let's just say again, it's me. Um, I go into the studio. I'm my own maker. I for the uh, the uh, the sound recording, I have a sound recording copyright. Again, let's just say my career takes off and I get some interest from record labels. I will then potentially maybe sign a deal with that record label to exploit those sound recordings. And again, similar to a publishing agreement, the uh, revenue will be um, will be split accordingly. Um, I could, in the simplest of scenarios, I know there's some scenarios talked about last time, could be my own. I could be the author both the author and maker of you know the sound of the uh, musical work and also the sound recording if i don't sign a deal if i don't sign a publishing deal if i don't sign a record label contract a licensing deal what have you with a with a record label um all these revenue streams come into me and that's great um uh you know some individuals don't have publishers or self published and um you know some recording artists don't have labels and that's that's okay um, oftentimes, you know, you get to a certain point in your career where having those, uh, you know, music partners make sense because although they're taking a big piece of the pie, um, they're presumably driving revenue and interest. They're exploiting your compositions in the case of a uh, music publisher. They're exploiting your sound recordings in the case of a record label. And that's hopefully going to drive a whole lot more revenue for you than, than you otherwise would get. At least that's, you know, notionally how, um, how it should work. Whether that happens in, in, in reality is, is sort of a different story. So, you know, always carefully consider uh, the various agreements that you're going to enter into. But so, so that's a little bit of the overlap, I think, from from last time, but just wanted to kind of go over those copyright basics as I see them um, break down a little bit these, you know, these revenue streams. Well, I'm not going to speak to them. Again, if you want to talk about, if you want to uh, get a refresher on the revenue streams, the royalties, certainly go back to the past uh, few uh, sessions, part one and two, which are really helpful. Um, but more or less, this is how, um, you know, royalty streams, revenue streams and music uh, work, depending on how these copyrights are used will dictate um, how the money flows into who and to where. Um, and and registration is obviously critically important. And, and again, I'm, I'm fighting the desire to get into that stuff right now. But again, I don't I don't think it's necessary because I think all of it was covered very well last time. Um, another sort of example of of how rights flow within music. And, and this is why music uh, copyright and royalties and revenue streams is so complicated is because it is complicated um, because there are a whole lot of rights flowing to different parties. Um, 
And this is just one example. This document is a few years old now, and I, I think could be updated. So, um, so don't take a picture of it and, and think that it's perfect. But just gives you an example of you know, um, uh, you know, Rufus Wainwright, Hallelujah. Um, if you if you run with that sort of orange bar, or orange red bar, um, on the musical work side, that's how that copyright will eventually make money. The various um, societies uh, acronyms that you will interact with in your in your career, and then the blue solid bar is the focus on the sound recording. And conversely, all of the organizations that you'll likely deal with in exploiting um, that sound recording, uh, um, and eventually you you know you sign up with these the appropriate. Um, organizations, and you will hopefully um, see royalties and revenue flow in the more um, the uh, sound recording is exploited, and and ideally the more the uh, musical work is exploited. But a lot of people, I, I think, go through a lot of these sessions and scratch their head. Um, they might retain some of it, maybe not all of it, um, and that's okay. Um, and but I think if, if you look at this, it kind of paints a, a, a picture that this isn't something that's going to come overnight. Um, I think folks have to be proactive. From my perspective, it's sort of a lifelong <laughs> endeavor to understand all this, familiar, familiarize yourself with it. I think Steve Carroll last time noted, you know, once a year, you know, check out your registrations, do some admin work, some housekeeping. Couldn't agree more uh, with that. You know, you might have a catalog of 20, 30 musical works or sound recordings and, and have everything up to date. Um, but if you release a track, if you release a new record, you've got to do it all over again. And you got to make sure you're you're uh, registered with the right organizations and you're not leaving money on the table. And so with that, that's just sort of a quick recap of maybe copyright basics, revenue streams without getting too much into the weeds. And I'm more than happy to take any uh, questions either now, or you can email me or feel free to get in touch with, uh, uh, with, uh, Byron or Steve, uh, on that. So Alex, I don't know if you're still there. Maybe, maybe I'll stop there for a quick second to see if there are questions. Otherwise, maybe I'll just keep moving along to potential music agreement, red flags. So far, it looks like everything's going pretty well. No questions. Uh, we're doing good. I'm good. really liking the, yeah, I love the uh, the recap. And um, yeah, let's just keep it moving. I'm excited to, I'm really excited about this part. The red flags, I know they touched on it a little bit, but I don't yeah. think, like, as an artist myself, a lot of our, well, all of our members are, are artists. And a lot of the people in the office that I work with are, are artists as well. So this is always uh Anything that can potentially steal some some of our uh, our our hard work is is always something to look at. So I'm really excited about this. Yeah, no, sounds good. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'll keep moving along. So um, this section here, I'm going to cover some potential music agreement red flags. Um, these aren't specific per se to any one agreement within the music industry. And and in one section, I'll I'll sort of go through the number of different agreements that you could see within the music industry. But I wanted to kind of come up with a, a list that I think apply to at least one, if not more than one, um, agreements that folks may see uh, within their music career. So, for example, terms that are way too long with too many options and aggressive product writing commitments. So there is quite a bit in there. And then a, a record contract, for example, that could cover three or four or five long paragraphs, <laughs> very dense, densely worded uh, paragraphs. Um, the terms I always look at, it's not very sexy, but one of the most important parts of your deal, whether it's a management deal or a publishing uh, contract or a record contract, I look at the term as how long are you exclusively married to that partner? You know, Normally when you're in a management deal or with, when you're in a record contract or a publishing deal, it's an exclusive arrangement between you as the writer with a publishing deal or a performer recording artist with a record label um, or as just generally artist with, with a manager, a personal manager. And um, terms, for example, in a publishing or record uh, deal, for example, you know, could be an initial period of say, you know, one year or it could be an initial period where you have to deliver say, you know, 10 tracks during uh, a period of no longer than one year. Um, fine, fair enough. But there could be an additional one, two, three, even four option periods in which a publisher or a record contract or a record label, for example, could extend uh, that period. So if you have an initial period of one year and say two options, uh, a, record, uh, a record label has two options, initial period and two options. Some people might think, oh, gee, that's just three years and, and that's not too bad. 
But in actuality, it could be a whole lot longer than three years. And I really, really encourage folks that when they're reviewing their publishing agreements and when they're reviewing their record contracts and, and hopefully you get in touch with, uh, with a lawyer, um, uh, you really pay attention to that term and the implications of it. Because, for example, you could have an initial period where, say, you have to deliver you know, uh, 10 sound recordings within a one-year period. And then uh, the record company may not need to release that music for, say, another six months. And then after that six-month period, that record, contra that record label uh, may have another 12 months um, after the commercial release of that uh, record before they need to determine whether they're going to exercise that next option or not. And so you maybe are a year in after you deliver another six months um, uh, before it's commercially released, and then maybe up to another year exercise, you know, option number one. And if there's another option after that or another option after that, you know, that term could span a very, very, very long period of time. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. You could have a really, really great uh, record label. You're working well together. That, that could be fine. And in some circumstances, um, you know, a, a longer term could make sense. But for an artist, I mean, generally speaking, you want to watch that and you want to, you know, make sure that your, um, you know, your, your, your term is not too long and, you, and you're not married to your music partner for an unreasonably long period of time. Because I always say to um, artists, producers, et cetera, that whether it's a management deal, publishing or record deal, um, even if it's a short one, if the artist is doing very, very well and the record label is doing very, very well and the parties are getting along and they're good, very likely that deal is going to be renegotiated and renewed in any event. It just means that um, they can do it on their own terms. The artist can do it on their terms. And maybe if they're doing very, very well, they can uh, renegotiate and potentially get a slightly better deal uh, when they do renew. So um, just something to consider. Um, unnecessarily long exploitation period. You sometimes see that in publishing deals. So normally, um, you know, I'd like to distinguish between the, the term and an exploitation period. For example, in a publishing deal, um, the term like we just talked about might be the period in which you are married to the publisher. So maybe that's an initial period um, where you have to deliver 10 songs. And then maybe there's another option period where you have to deliver, say, another 10 songs. Um, and after that, the term is over. And if you really wanted to, after the term, you could sign with another publisher the next day. However, that publisher might retain an exploitation period on those, say, 20 songs for as long as forever, <laughs> or maybe as short as, say, five years or maybe as long as 10, 15 years. It's all maybe um, negotiable. Um, uh, everything's negotiable at the end of the day, depending on the bargaining power. Um, but an exploitation period generally shouldn't run in perpetuity. And if it does, you know, there has to probably be a pretty good reason for that. Um, I was just speaking with a client last week, actually, who signed a deal and they didn't get advice uh, before they signed it. And there, you know, there's an exploitation period in perpetuity with respect to a catalog that is not insignificant. Um, and so we're at a point right now where, uh, you know, after the fact, we may have to go back to this publisher with very little bargaining power after a deal has been signed to potentially strike some kind of deal about um, uh, limiting that exploitation period and what at, and at what cost that's going to be. I, I can sitting here right now, I couldn't tell you. But one thing to watch out for is exploitation periods. Um, this one's maybe a bit of an obvious one, but royalty commission profit splits that aren't fair. Um, another good reason, if you're entering into a relationship with a music partner, to get in touch with a, you know, with a lawyer or at least a trusted advisor within the industry before you you sign something to talk about, well, what royalty or commission or profit split is fair? And the, you know, the short answer is it, is it depends. But you know, for example, in you know, there is industry custom and industry standards for sure. So, for example, if I'm representing an artist that um, was presented with a management deal, um, if that manager is looking for 50% commissions on everything, uh, dare I say that is very high. Uh, that's on the high side. Um, maybe someone who who um, is not familiar with music contracts or not familiar with um, what fair commissions look like may not know or question that un until they meet with an advisor. But you know, normally you see management commissions and you know the uh, you know the 10 to 20% net receipts or, or gross receipts uh, range, for example. 
Um, you know, if you're signing with a small to mid-level sort of indie record label and it's a, um, you know, it's a profit share agreement, normally it's going to be sort of a net 50-50 deal. Um, you know, a deal that we're, you know, we're essentially um, the label recovers all of its costs and whatever is left in the pot is split 50-50 between the label and the artist. <laughs> Much more complicated than that, but in a nutshell, that's sort of how those work. And so, um, you know, a, a small or an indie label that approaches you and wants, say, a 70-30 net profit share deal might be a bit, I, I might say that's a bit unusual, for example, but obviously have to see the deal. Um, but obviously, you know, a red flag if, if the, those profit splits, if those commissions are just uh, not looking good from the beginning. Um, this is a huge one and I won't, I, it can't be overstated, but being discouraged from retaining independent legal counsel. I don't often see this, but do sometimes see it. Um, especially in maybe dodgy management type relationships where a management deal hasn't been signed. Um, a manager maybe presents a, uh, uh, an artist with a management contract and the manager says, um, yeah, I had my lawyer look at it. You know, no worries. We're all good. Um, no, that's, that's not how it works. And no, you're not all good. Um, the manager will have his or her, they, and, or their own lawyer and the artist should have their own lawyer for the purposes of negotiating that deal. Every party there should have independent legal advice. Um, and most music partners, um, that you'll engage with normally are encouraging. It's the opposite. Normally they're encouraging of, you know, their artists, uh, creatives going out and getting independent legal counsel. And that's a good thing. Um, it should always be the case. Um, Byron may have even covered this one, I think, during the la one of the last sessions. But I always say inconsistencies between a contract uh, between the, the contract and discussion over beers. So if you went to, you know, uh, Music Nova Scotia or Manitoba a Music Week or January, um, <laughs> what was the one that I went to? Uh, January Music Month. And you meet somebody, you meet a partner, and you talk about, you know, high level sort of terms and expectations from each other, whether it's a publisher or a manager or a label. And then the contract comes your way and it couldn't be further from the discussions you had well, there's a bit of a disconnect there and a bit of a problem for sure. Um, could be just a misunderstanding between, you know, the manager, the label, the the publisher, for example, and their their own lawyer. And sometimes that happens. There's miscommunication. And um, but but you always want to make sure that whatever you talked about beforehand is captured within the contract, at least the high level deal terms, and never assume that they will be. Um, again, I can't stress that enough. Never assume that when you get a contract, it's going to reflect. Um, those discussions that you had, you have to read it very carefully, because by the time you know, if when you ha um, when you had that conversation with whoever at whatever music conference, for example, or whatever uh, you know club or venue or show, that deal may have touched a whole lot of other hands before it ultimately ended up in the hands of of you, the creative, the artist, the writer, the performer. Um, so make sure you're careful there. Um, Uncapped expense clause, expenses should be reasonable and artists should have a pre-approval mechanism. Some labels will push back on this. Some some will say, well, well, no, I can't check in every time I'm going to pre-approve an expense. But um, normally your, your music contracts will say that if the you know publisher um, incurs costs or expenses or if your label does, you know, that will be uh, that will be recouped from, um, you know, from royalties or revenue generated. Um, if possible, you know, if if uh, if publisher and label, for example, aren't going to um, seek artist approval for for single transactions, which normally you wouldn't get, that is maybe a little, um, you know, on the uh, sort of overbearing side, um, you could get sort of you know a, a cap on a cumulative amount of money per month, we'll say, before the label or publisher then has to come back to the artist and say, hey, are you good with this? So maybe it's you know five hundred dollars. Um, maybe single expenses of, of 500 or a thousand dollars or you know cumulative expenses of pick the number 1500 or 2000 in one month um, if the uh, music partner exceeds that amount well then you need to have a discussion um, and and artist uh, should be uh, should be signing off on that um, so that's something to, to, to keep uh, in mind again won't always get it some some partners will push back on it but for me it, it seems very reasonable and it's a way for um, you know for for my clients anyway I advise them that it's one way you might as well see if you can get it because it's one way of, of uh, monitoring costs very very carefully um, overly broad power of returning clause um, 
uh, you'll see this sometimes standard form language. Um, I'll draw maybe folks' attention specifically to, to management contracts where there's a very, very broad power of attorney clause. Normally, I would suggest industry standard around power of attorney clauses is that the manager can sign on your behalf for limited purposes. And so maybe that is, you know, manager can sign contracts on behalf of their artist um, for up to three consecutive performance engagements within a one month period or something like that. Um, other management contracts I've seen there, the power of attorney clause is um, open-ended and the manager can sign on behalf of um, their client for anything. I always scratch my head when I see that. I don't think it's necessary. Don't always think it's reasonable. There, there might be exceptions to that. Um, uh, as an aside, I have a bit of a wills and estates background as well. And, you know, if, if anyone out there has estate planning documents and, you know, they're, they also are subject to a artist management um, contract, um, want to make sure as well that there's no conflict between your estate planning documents and your management deal, which has a, an attorney clause in it. Um, I've seen that kind of go uh, sour once in the past. Um, bit of a nuanced kind of point, um, but not impossible for those documents to, to clash. So one thing to keep in mind, um, if you do have estate planning documents and, and you do find yourself in an artist manager relationship where there is a, a power of attorney clause. Um, just a few more before we go on to the terrifying uh, case studies. Um, uh, being asked to give away too many rights, i.e. masters in a publishing deal or publishing in a recording deal, for example. So I think my point here is really, um, you know, if you're signing a record contract, um, the record contract really is a services agreement between artists as performer who's providing exclusive recording services to a record label. Full stop, that's traditionally what, what it is. Um, and normally, traditionally, the record label um, has rights only to the, the master recording, the sound recordings, and they're in the business of exploiting those sound recordings and trying to make some money. Um, of course, though, there are uh, recording contracts you'll see that are maybe 360 type deals or ancillary, ancillary rights deals where not only does the record label maybe have um, uh, exclusive control over exploiting sound recordings, the artist sound recordings, but maybe also they're going to get a piece of publishing, or maybe they're also going to get a piece of merchandise or live touring revenue, fan club income, or any and all other revenue generated by artists in their entire life. <laughs> Whether they get into acting or uh, modeling or public speaking or whatever, you sometimes see that. And, and, and again, sometimes we refer to those as 360 deals. Um, I, I caution people when, you know, when you're presented with a contract, just make sure um, that that's what you bargained for. And I'm not saying that, that uh, those kind of agreements are the wrong kind of ones to sign in all instances, uh, but they can be a wake up call or a surprise to some artists that weren't expecting them. And um, an ancillary rights clause um, can, I've seen it buried in a contract before, and it doesn't take very much. Um, for that to you know be effective and to kind of change the whole nature of the of the deal and i've unfortunately seen artists sign deals like that then only recognize that they're they're giving up a piece of um, other revenue streams that they didn't intend to give up um so certainly be be mindful of that um this comes to mind as well just because we, you know we are talking about the practical here what also comes to mind is in management contracts you'll sometimes see um, normally with commissions, generally speaking, the manager will be entitled to a commission generally on with respect to all aspects of the artist's career. It doesn't have to be, you know, sometimes it's purely related to music, but it may also be related to, you know, endorsements and acting and anything else that the artist may do within the, the entertainment business. However, if an artist is coming to the table um, and meeting their manager for the first time and they're coming to the table with, say, um, an academic background and they engage in public speaking and where they make good amount of money. I'm just drawing from that example because I have a client that does just that. Uh, we negotiated that, hey, you know what, manager, you're not touching any of this uh, money. Um, you know, this individual has um, has a great career already of, of speaking and doing writing. Um, they've worked the last 10, 15, 20 years to establish that. And so that's not that's that's off limits. And uh, and that was maybe OK in that particular uh, situation. Um, but again, not, not saying that, that that always has to be the case, but you know, if you're an artist or creative, ask yourself, you know, before you're signing the management deal, 
if there's a certain kind of revenue stream that you developed independently um, that you don't think maybe manager will contribute to and maybe that revenue stream is off the table. For example, um, again, there's so many variations for these types of agreements um, and literally every deal is different, unique and tailored to the individual. So uh, that's just one thing to, to keep in mind. Um, and by the way, none of this is legal advice. Boom, <laughs> there you have it. I should have done that from the, uh, from the outset. Um, uh, maybe let's just skip through a few of these. Uh, how are we doing for time? Oh, geez, it's 2.40 already. Um, overly light on responsibilities, obligations. Um, I get this question a lot. Normally, believe it or not, and, and a lot of folks maybe on the call already have experience with this, um, but within the contract itself, it may not indicate that a publisher or a label needs to do much, if anything. <laughs> um, oftentimes, you know, you're entering into these agreements with these publishers or with these labels because, you know, they've been around a while, presumably, or they've got an, a roster of clients um, and artists that you can communicate with or that you know of and they're doing good work with them. Um, but normally, oftentimes within these contracts, it doesn't always say that you know, publisher is going to do X, Y, Z, or record label is going to do X, Y, Z, and um, and and keep that in mind and, and query whether whether it should. And so, one example that I have is you know, in some publishing uh, deals and even some management deals, uh, we've been able to work in um, a, a threshold or a trigger clause, which essentially says you know, there's an initial term, um, maybe one or two options, and we covered that you know a few slides uh, a few slides ago. Um, but if you publisher or you manager aren't making X amount of money for your artist slash writer, um, well, then the contract terminates and you no longer have that right to, um, to exercise the option. Um, so revenue targets is maybe one way of doing it. Um, a lot of music partners will push back on that. Um, but again, query whether or not that's, uh, that's necessary or relevant or appropriate. And just one way of, I think, um, you know, thinking of ways in which music partners can bake into their contracts certain obligations and responsibilities because normally i think it's fair to say they're light <laughs> and generally speaking in contracts historically not to say they all are um but i'd like to think that we can sort of move the needle on that whenever you know um you know my music law for motion town music is acting on behalf of artists i always try to sort of push the envelope a little bit and say yeah i know that's been done the last 30 years i get it <laughs> but this time for this year, on this day, let's try this. Um, no harm in trying. Um, no termination clause. You know, I think of management contracts, for example, and um, you know, again, if there, you know, sometimes there's um, what I'm thinking of is a, a contract where there was no term, um, absolutely no term, um, no termination clause as to when the artist might be able to terminate. Nothing, and so that's a bit of a problem um, uh, because in a particular case, I can think of that artist tried to get out of the contract and there was a little bit of uh, back and forth on that um and last but not least i have here guaranteed fixed amount for the counterparty even if writer artist isn't earning um certainly fact dependent i think of for example maybe management deals where manager is getting a fixed amount a month now <laughs> not saying that that is always the wrong thing to do um for managers that are out there um and i know of some that, that that you know operate that way and i think more and more managers nowadays i think are kind of putting on more of a consulting hat and and and, and billing or charging you know clients on a monthly basis i'm not saying that that's always a bad thing but consider whether that's the way it, it should be um or whether the more traditional you know traditional um management contract um uh, should be applied from a commission perspective. That is, you know, the the the, the manager is normally only making money when the artist is, and so it's normally typically a huge investment um, in time and energy from the manager. But they obviously would reap the the rewards and benefits of a pretty good chunk of the artist's income should that artist start to earn uh, money. Um, again, maybe I'll stop there. Alex, how are we doing, man? <laughs> I'm talking a lot. I don't know if any questions, but I'm happy to sort of jump right into the terrifying case studies. I've kind um, of been trying. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm. Yeah, the this is this is my this is this is what I really want. This is like <laughs> okay, you know, I want I want to be scared. I want everybody to be. No, I don't want everybody to be scared. But I really like hearing about this stuff. You know. No. It's yeah, for sure. And I and I to be honest, I try to I tried to kind of 
cover off certain factual situations as I was going through those last slides and, and figured that's what would happen as sure. I sort of went through. Here specifically, I did come up with a few um, scenarios. And to Alex's point, I mean, not trying to scare anybody here. I think all we're trying to kind of relay is, you know, some things can go wrong if you don't have agreements in place. And yeah. if you don't understand, you know, each other's expectations, you haven't turned your mind to, um, you know, what the division, uh, you know, what the song splits are going to be, or what the producer is going to get paid, or or whatever. You haven't read your your beat lease or beat license agreement in detail. Um, you know, there can be problems. And so, just a few examples here, and I've given them all uh, names. So this one's called the clearance cluster F. Um, so Lil Gorm X signed a record deal. As part of that deal, artists was required, among other things, to deliver an album during initial period. Artists also require artists was also required to deliver slash assign a pre-existing master as part of that deal, um, which was a hit single. Um, artists had an exclusive ten-year license to the beat um, on his hit track, and there was also a one uh, video restriction within that beat uh, license agreement. So, on its face, maybe not so terrifying maybe requires just a little bit of an explanation so in this case record deal um, um, a good label um, there was a pre-existing master um, which was sort of a, the artist hit single before going into that record contract um, all good and artist actually assigned copyright to that label uh, was assigning copyright there was I think a, um, a seven or a ten year copyright uh, reversion um, in the agreement that I'm thinking of um, but in this case, um, you know, assignment of a copyright to that hit single. Now, the only problem is the artist thought um, that they had uh, full rights to that beat. They thought that they had a beat buyout, um, in which case, no problem. The beat would have been owned. Um, cop uh, the copyright in the beat would have been owned by the artist. And mm -hmm. therefore, the artist would have been able to assign um, that beat, that hit single, to the label like was captured within the uh, record contract between the artist and the label. But mm -hmm. the problem is the artist didn't have a beat buyout. The, the artist did not own the beat. The artist only had, uh, uh, who came, came to find out, an exclusive 10-year license to the beat. Not only that, but there were some restrictions with respect to that, uh, that beat license agreement. For example, it, you, know, you couldn't uh, surpass a certain number of streams. Wow. Also, you couldn't make more than one music video. And guess what this artist was doing? He was making a second music video associated with this hit with the label, which he was not permitted to do. Not only that, but the artist cannot, under his record contract, purport to assign something that he doesn't own. And so the artist only had a 10-year license to the beat because the artist did not own the beat. He could not have then assigned that hit single to the track and wow. guess what? That artist represented and warranted in that contract that he had, you know, all those sort of, you know, clauses that no one wants to read. You yeah. always need to pay attention to your representations and warranties, which is essentially what artist is promising to the other party. You know, the artist is promising that they have any and all rights needed to um, um, uh, to deliver what's required to the label. And in this case, they didn't have it. They were in breach of contract. So what needed to be done? Well, um, this artist needed to track down this uh, beat maker yeah. um, <laughs> who basically had all the bargaining power. And that beat maker walked away um, with a very, very, very good uh, fee for a beat buyout. Um, this was a beat, it turned out, that um, folks uh, were very interested in. Um, liked. And as a matter of fact, uh, I've made a mistake there. It wasn't even an exclusive 10 year lease. It was a non exclusive 10 year license. Whoa. And, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And so uh, what happened was to do cleanup, the artist needed to go back to this beat maker, negotiate a beat buyout. And at that point in time, the artist had zero bargaining power. Um, it cost the artist a whole lot of money. Um, but to uh, remedy the breach under contract, this needed to be done. And this is just one small, tiny example. I think the broader takeaway um, here and take home is that for producers, for artists, for hip hop artists, pop artists that um, get beats, just make sure you know what you have. And mm -hmm. I know this was talked about during some of the prior sessions. If you only have a, say, a 10 year license to the beat, um, well, you just got to keep in mind that if you ever get to a point where a record label 
you know, wants to enter, enter into an agreement with you, well, you cannot purport to assign copyright in any of those tracks to a label if you only have a 10 year lease of an underlying beat embedded within a master. And so that's where you need to retain counsel um, to go through your contracts if you need to, to make sure that you're not offside on your reps and warranties. For example, if you're getting into a contract with a record label. Um, so that's that's sort of scenario number one. How, does that make sense, Alex? Am I uh, no? Am I, it's, it's, scaring, it's, am I scaring you? <laughs> no, it's good. It's 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 uh, it's a little it's it's interesting. Um, I love uh, I love the, the the two sides of that. I mean, it sounds like you had an artist that yeah wasn't really aware uh, of of the intricacies of all that, but it also sounds like you have a a beat a, a beat maker that was very savvy and uh uh you know had a lot of yeah. it seems like some poison pills embedded in this uh in this situation yeah it, it's a good point and you know what um you know I, i've no i've no i've no doubt there are maybe producers and beat makers out there <clears throat> that know what they're doing in in this regard in this sense i don't really necessarily think there were any kind of um uh there was there was no i think motivation to kind of trip anybody up here um, I think this was a beat maker that had a lot of beats. This was mm -hmm. one particular beat that was really, really dope. Everyone seemed to want it. Um, it's a great sounding beat. And it just so happens that this was a scenario that, that he found himself in. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people wanted it. You know, there was, there was a lot of uh, a volume there. Like, he, he, you know, he was leasing this thing a number of times and making good money doing it. And yeah. so it turned out that if someone actually wanted to buy it, you know, he was in a position where he makes probably a pretty sound commercial decision to say, Hey, you know, someone wants to actually buy this such that I can no longer make money from this. Well, you have yeah. to really pay for it. And so again, um, in art, as in, you know, from the artist's perspective, um, just make sure, you know, um, you know, uh, what your agreements say and yeah. the, the purpose of the beat, if it's really just to get some beats, go on beat stars, make some demos, great yeah. all power to you like there's tons of 35.99 beats and 50 dollars beats and ch cheaper to make your demo go do that yeah. fill your boots but don't think you can go do that get beats on your whole record for like under 300 dollars. yeah and then think that if your record blows up you may not have any problems if you want to sign deals down the road that's yeah. just a, a word to the wise it's all no it's really good and i i also in your example it's uh i think another crucial aspect of that was the the agreement the, the artist wasn't really sure about the agreement in the beginning like you, you were saying but even the next step after is they didn't go back even earlier and try and and preempt like some of this the mix up you know like hey i made this really good song i really look at at that point they didn't go back to the beat maker and try and clear that up either it was after yeah. they tried to remedy it after we realized how much how big it was and how much money everybody stood to make and all of a sudden like you said that that bargaining power of the beat maker was in just sky high instead of tackling it um e even that situation entering into it with the least beat trying to straighten that out early in the process absolutely yeah key key is to straighten it all out early in the process unfortunately this was a process where lawyers get involved um uh late um rights were obtained that uh you know folks didn't fully understand they, they seem to overstate what kind of rights they did have. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you're not in this world and you sign a contract for a beat and you know, it's a, it's, you know, it says 10 or 15 years on it. Um, and it says license. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're not a lawyer, if you don't see these things all the time, maybe you think that's good enough. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, just, just one kind of, you know, example to, to, to suggest that a seemingly decent license for a long period of time just doesn't cut it depending on you know what future agreements you you might sign with with the record label who expects all those rights to be perfectly clear um and that's where and i think byron may have may have noted noted this last time obviously you know if you're if you're um, serious about your music if the goal is to make money if you're making a record you know you always want to um, get that um you know in the grant of rights clause you you want to get uh, a copyright to that beat ideally um likely mm -hmm. we'll we'll pay for it but but that's you know those are you know from an artist's perspective that's what you want so i'm just going to say that's that's really what you want if you're looking to commercially exploit your music and you're looking to make money off it um and you're shooting for the stars you really need to own the underlying um elements uh, or at least control them um to uh to your sound recordings cool yeah, let's do it. What's the, what do we got next? <laughs>
Yeah, so this one is called Late is Not Much Better Than Never. So this is um, Patsy's a song writer and producer. She produced and co-wrote 10 tracks with her friend LL Cool Ray. Um, these tracks have generated hundreds of millions of streams. Uh, Patsy had no agreements with LL. When Patsy finally pursued the matter, LL's lawyer offered a buyout for $1,500. So another... I think a, a takeaway here is to have discussions up front and get your agreements up front. So here's a situation where a super talented individual who's writing songs, um, producing songs, recording songs, um, did so for a friend um, and no agreements were done, no producer fees, no points uh, uh, arranged, no discussion around sound exchange, no discussion around songwriter splits. Um, Fast forward a number of, of years, um, this individual, you know, the performer is streaming hundreds and hundreds of millions. Uh, these songs are streaming hundreds and hundreds of millions of times. Um, Patsy kind of scratched her head and thought, gee, wait a minute, we never did, you know, formalize all this stuff. I didn't even realize how much money can be made off of these songs. Mm -hmm. I know I wrote this one and that one, um, but, I, but gee, I don't think we actually confirmed that. Um, oh, and someone now told me about, you know, so can ask at BMI. I looked on the on the, uh, the the registration details and my name is not there. And then I sort of poked the bear and got a letter back um, from a lawyer with the backup saying, no, you're only entitled to fifteen hundred dollars. Um, sign this and you'll sign over sort of all any and all rights you had to any of this music. So mm -hmm. I think probably quite a bad deal, <laughs> I would say, um, in a situation like this where where music is is making um, lots and lots of money streaming millions and millions of times. Um, and this is just a, a scenario, I think, where, you know, the artist just gets involved very, very late in thinking about business. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a maybe a, a, a textbook kind of scenario where um, you really got to be thinking at the front end. OK, well, if I'm writing some of these songs, yeah. well, I'm a songwriter. I should be a co-writer and we're let's do our split sheets or let's do a co-writer agreement. Let's do something that shows that I am a 50% copyright owner of the composition. Full stop, mm. check. Um, no matter, you know, and and uh, once registered, you know, 50%, for example, of the performance royalties associated with that song for the public performance would be going to that co-writer, you know, check. Mm. Um, but they're also a producer. And so they probably, you know, should have been getting a producer fee. Um, wow. They could have been getting, you know, worked in a, um, uh, a points or a producer royalty. Um, you know, uh, that would have been, you know, when the producer fee may or may not have been recouped, wh whatever. Um, and the producer may uh, likely have been entitled to, you know, or could have negotiated maybe some sound exchange royalties, which, you know, I think during the last sessions that was discussed is that third bucket of digital mm. performance royalties. Um, so again, go check out those prior sessions if you uh, want to talk about, if you want, if you want to learn more about neighboring rights and uh, sound exchange in the United States and digital, digital performance of the, the master and all that kind of stuff. But, mm. you know, rambly way of saying, I think, Alex, that again, just one of those extreme situations where um, you know, the music does blow up and there's no agreements evidencing, evidencing, you know, what that individual um, should have probably negotiated from the beginning. Yeah, no, I, but the part that the part that's really interesting about all these examples is people get into making music because they enjoy it. Obviously, you work hard at it. You try and get good at it. You want to write. I, all of us want to write a hit song. And it's funny that so many artists work so hard to achieve something and by not doing this stuff it's almost like you didn't expect that you were ever going to be able to do it because if we if we had anticipated that we were going to be able to do it hopefully we'd be looking at this stuff i guess what i'm trying to say in that whole aspect of it is everybody i believe in you you will write a hit song i i know it for a fact everybody watching this so just make sure that when you do that you have your your bases covered so in this case yeah. patsy had no what what if Patsy walked into your office, what what, what could Patsy do? It, like after yeah. the fact. Well, I think the the first thing to do is kind of unpack. Okay, well, what would Patsy normally have been entitled to, and what 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 are her entitlements here? Mm -hmm. You know, so potentially she's a she's a songwriter. Sounds like she was a producer. Potentially, you know, would have been entitled to producer fee. She didn't receive any fees. She didn't receive a producer fee. 
um, you know, at a minimum, maybe she's entitled to some sort of points or um, net receipts of mm -hmm. master exploitation for the tracks. Um, mm. Likely entitled to maybe sound exchange for uh, her role as producer. And we didn't even get into the fact that for some of these, Patsy also was a performer on the record, you know, wow. doing a vocal performance uh, with respect to some of the hooks. And yeah. so um, there's there's that aspect as well. And so I think what I would normally do if Patsy walked into my office is understand what went down, understand what Patsy's entitlements should maybe be, what what would be reasonable. And I got to reach out to that other artist. I got to reach out to their management team and say, look, this is what's up. Let's talk about right. this. Let's let's get a dialogue going. Yeah, that's a Maybe starting point. Um, you might get something right away or you uh, might get someone telling you to go pound sand. I didn't receive <laughs> that yet. <laughs> um, yeah. Or there are other sort of ways to sort of, uh, you know, um, apply the pressure we'll say that we don't need to get into right now but there yeah. are certain sort of tricks and tips to sort of apply pressure in different ways um, yeah. um that that again you know if if someone's facing this sort of scenario we can talk about it uh, but again the first the you know the first thing to do is to to chat with this individual find out what went down and what is reasonable and hopefully awesome. the other party is reasonable and hopefully mm -hmm. the other party has legal counsel i always find that if the other side is represented by a lawyer, some people think, oh, that's not good. They've got a lawyer now. No, no, that is good. Um, typically, you know, I'm, I'm confident more often than not that entertainment counsel on the other side can can uh, talk sense into their client. And part of their job is to explain to them what is and what is not reasonable. And normally I find that's a good thing when lawyers are involved. So that's where nice. I start. Yeah, I do. I appreciate that. Uh, two important things that I do before we go into the next example they were friends. I really like that aspect because a lot of times when we're working with somebody, it's a very friendly thing and money getting involved can unfortunately sour the situation. So friendship, no matter how close you are with somebody, if you really do care about your friendship in music, make sure you sign a contract. I feel like that's the best way to protect a friendship is sign the contract ahead of time. If you want to keep your friends, make sure that's clean. So I like that. And then I saw that and then I'm noticing the buyout part before we move to the next part. Um, I'm a, I would really hope that Patsy would, instead of accepting the buyout, if she's not sure, she would she would reach out to some legal counsel before she actually fully agrees to that. Just find out her options before. Absolutely, you know, uh, absolutely, yeah, no, for sure, and um, yeah, and and have, we'll we'll leave it at that because I, I yeah. think that was a good discussion and really great points. Alex, agree with everything you just said. Awesome. Um, so so the the next one is more of an investment kind of thing, relationship gone sour, business and pleasure. Um, maybe I'll skip over that one in the interest of time and For sure. kind of maybe close on what I'm calling, I guess, the clause from hell or the MDRC clause. And I see this still sometimes, and this is sort of a word um, of caution for folks in publishing deals. And I've seen this a whole lot of times, um, especially in older deals. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see them too often in newer deals, but I've seen them incorporated in some publishing deals. And so this one, Sally signed a publishing deal. The initial term of the contract was not satisfied until songs were delivered and released, commercially released by artists through a major record label. At the time of signing a deal, at the time of signing, a deal with a major was in the works, but then um, uh, fell, fell through. And I've seen this a number of times. They're referred to as MDRC clauses, minimum delivery release requirements. Um, again, you'll see them kind of in older publishing deals. I've, I still see them pop up every now and again, but essentially, um, in, in most kind of publishing deals, you'll see, you know, an initial um, uh, period where, say, the songwriter needs to deliver, say, 10 songs um, mm -hmm. to publisher, and that's it. And then the publisher is required to commercially, you know, exploit, um, you know, the, publish the publisher is in the business of commercially exploiting those songs, and hopefully money is made. Um, however, there are, there are some clauses where the uh, publisher says, no, that's not a good enough. You don't just have to deliver 10 songs to me. Mm -hmm. You also have to commercially release those songs. And those songs have to be released through, say, uh, a mid or a large size indie label or in worst case scenario, a major label. Mm -hmm. um, and for some people, I guess the long and the short of it is that may just never happen. <laughs> and so if that never happens, you are then uh, more or less stuck in an initial contract period with a publisher and you have to try to negotiate your way out of it um wow. 
not sure if other lawyers are listening or other um, songwriters are out there who are listening who may have seen those or has, have experience with them. Um, I did a, a panel with a bunch of other lawyers uh, for um, for Canadian Music Week, I guess, two years ago uh, with Yuwanda Carter and Susan Abramovich and Ed Shapiro and a few others. And we talked about these sort of clauses as well, um, where there's just like from my perspective, there's no other kind of more severe horror story than an artist signing a deal where um, um, where the term does not end until the artist does something that may likely never happen. <laughs> it's not just enough to deliver your music. You have to re commercially release these songs with a major label and that may not never happen. And so, you know, what next? And so again, you know, you're either sort of um, uh, stuck in this sort of initial period or you have to negotiate your way out of it. Um, and, uh, and, and those MDRC minimum delivery release requirements sometimes are called something different. Um, uh, just keep an eye out for them, um, okay. or keep an eye out first, you know, any other kind of clause for that matter and any other kind of music agreement where, um, the, the term is contingent on something else playing out. And I think that's, that's a really, at least from my perspective, that's a, that's a takeaway. And I don't see this every day. I'm not trying to scare everybody in thinking that, oh, this is what you're going to see in a publishing deal. No, but they're out there. And there are a lot of old forms that are out there. And there are a lot of people that maybe, you know, go online, even publishers for that matter, you know, take an old template contract, adopt it, think that that's maybe industry standard and, and here you go. Mm. Um, so just be, you know, just be careful, not only for that clause in particular, but clauses in which, <clears throat> um, you know, you're you're not off the hook. You're not out of the contract um, until you do something, which is then contingent on something else. Is is maybe you know, if I can put it in simple terms, is maybe the takeaway on that one. Okay, definitely. Um, yeah. so I, I know we're 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 three oh seven now. Like um, honestly, if you have Leah, yeah, you can yeah work through your stuff. I mean, if we run if we run a little bit over, that's that's okay. This is interesting and. Um, it's yeah. up to you. If you have the time, like, don't worry about it. No, for sure. Yeah. Happy to kind of plug along here. I only have a few more slides. Um, and, and the last chunk of this presentation really kind of focusing on the practical is when should I get a music lawyer? Yeah. Um, and, and just a few points on this. So at, at the latest, when you're presented with a contract, obviously, if you're if you're given a contract, you don't want to sign anything until, uh, you know, the lawyerly answer is, you know, get a get a lawyer to review your contract. Mm -hmm. um, it's as simple as that. But you or your man management team may want to engage one sooner to create the relationship. For example, I'm not speaking for anyone else, but I love to hear from people and I'm not going to bill people for a call if they want to talk shop. Um, they want to introduce themselves um, because as you're building your career and as you're building your music team, a lawyer should probably be on that team. Um, um, at some point in time, you'll want to engage your lawyer to do something for you in your music career. So it never hurts to reach out, whether it's myself or Byron or lots of um, you know entertainment lawyers out there. Just touch base with us and have a conversation and um, we'd love to hear from you and create that relationship even before you get that contract. Um, and like I say, there, there's, there's often work to do prior to the record publishing or management deal. For example, side artist agreements, co-writer agreements, corporate structure discussions, understanding royalties, et cetera. So, um, even before a deal comes in, um, oftentimes there's other stuff to do. Like, you know, you may have done an independent record in which, you know, you get um, a, a guitarist to perform um, on tracks three and seven, and you want to pay them X amount of money, X amount of dollars, money um, for their performance. Um, they're sort of waiving any and all rights they have to the sound recording or the composition, and they're a hired gun musician. And, and you know, that's something that you should probably have in your back pocket. Um, if you're co-writing, you know, you want to have your split sheets, your co-writer agreements, um, maybe even before you're, you're, you're signed, if that's something you're interested in doing down the road with a publisher or a label, um, think about your corporate structure. You know, if you're, if you're, um, a band, um, you know, are you carrying on business as a partnership? You know, does it make sense to incorporate a company? You know, if you're a solo artist, you know, if you're carrying on as a, uh, sole proprietorship where there's no distinction between your business and you, and there's no distinction between your business assets and your personal assets, maybe it makes sense at a certain point in time when you're making enough money to incorporate. And that's maybe that's maybe a session in and of itself on its own. So maybe I'll, I'll leave the, the corporate structure piece there and understanding royalties. And it's just exactly what we're talking about earlier today. And, you know, what's the, what was discussed in session one and two, you know, I get calls quite frequently where people want to talk about, you know, what is Connect or Racks or SoCan, you know, 
SoCan is really CM CMRA, right? Nope, they're, di they're different. They do different things. Let's talk about this. Let's break it down. Um, and again, sticking with the practical, a few scenarios just to get so the juices flowing. So these are all kind of you know examples of things that people have called me about. I just received this record deal. Can you review it for me? It doesn't get any more basic than that. Or I signed this horrible deal two years ago. Can you help me review my options? Get that one quite a bit. What is a mechanical royalty? Do songwriters get paid from social media? Short answer is they, they can. We can get into that. Maybe that's another session too. But again, royalty discussion, people trying to understand what's going on. Um, the producer of my last track on my last track just said he, she, they want 50% master royalties. Is that fair? Maybe, but maybe not. <laughs> and we kind of talked about that early. <clears throat> we kind of talked about that earlier. <clears throat> maybe a red flag if a producer wants uh, a share that's, that's maybe too big. Maybe some scenarios where that could make sense, but we need to talk about that. Um, my new band, the Rubik's Cubes, has a lot of potential. <laughs> um, should we enter into some kind of an agreement, a band agreement? Uh, maybe, yeah. Um, you know, band agreements are common agreements that that bands enter into. Um, bands, uh, more bands should enter into them, I should say. But it's not uncommon for bands to enter into into them, and they should. And band agreements will cover all kinds of different things, like. Um, you know, uh, potentially royalty splits on the masters and publishing, you know, um, what's the, the process for hiring a new member or firing a member, um, you know, a whole lot of, you know, what happens to the band name if the band breaks up? Mm -hmm. um, what about the band bank account? You know, who's got right, who's got the right to sign checks or remove money? And what's the voting around that? There's a whole host of things that you can cover off in a band agreement. Um, things just aren't working out among Chad, John, Flea and I, how do we end our band marriage? Um, similarly, you see band members who have been in a band for a long time and they just want out and they're not sure how to do it. Maybe there's some fighting, maybe there's not, but they want a clean break and they, you know, they've been, uh, band members for such a long period of time and their business affairs are so intermingled. They've got to figure out how to kind of walk away in a way that's very fair. And maybe that's splitting everything down the middle. Maybe that's something much different. Maybe one member wants to continue and use the band name. Um, maybe the others want to say formally of this band but do their own solo projects like there's a whole lot of different considerations there um my career is starting to heat up are there any benefits to incorporating a company we talked a little bit about that uh, for my next record i'm hiring a producer side artist and likely working with co-writers what agreements do i need well talked about this last in the last sessions and earlier in this presentation very likely a producer agreement very likely side artist agreements for the uh, the hired guns that are coming in to record with you mm -hmm. and um, you know doing the paperwork for your co-writers and someone stole the hook from my last track is that infringement you know copyright infringement is a super fun topic um, uh, you know typically you know you only see this play out uh, normally in the United States not very much in Canada because maybe the, the the money is just not there litigation especially copyright infringement cases and and, and music cases and context can run you know, in the in hundreds of thousands of dollars, easy. Okay. Um, but copyright infringement, um, making sure that you're not taking a substantial part of someone else's work is very critical or else guess what? That is copyright infringement, especially, you know, if you had access to that other uh, work, if you knew about that song and you took a piece of it anyway, um, mm. you know, could very well be infringing copyright. And so, uh, you know, I'm not a litigator, but sometimes do start the process to try to settle, figure things out uh, before it. You know, I hand the file off to someone who's more accustomed to uh, who who um, who more more so does um, uh, litigation within their day to day practice area. That's cool. Um, uh, and I think the very very last slide is just contracts you might see in the music business. And, I, and again, this maybe just is the bird's eye view of the things that are out there. Recording agreements, publishing agreements, we talked a bunch about that today. You know, artist management agreements, of course, you'll see those. You know, co-author collaboration agreements, we talked about those. Producer agreements with your with your producers for different tracks. Um, you know, you might have one producer for your whole album, especially in the rock, folk um, genres. You know, in, in the, uh, the hip-hop uh, world, it's not uncommon to have a producer uh, for every track on your record. And, and in fact, a clear track, uh, an album, not that long ago where I think there were about 14 or 15 different clearance agreements to get. Uh, it's not super uncommon. Um, beat license agreement. We talked about those and be careful about beat license agreements <laughs> because they have so many weird, little, unusual, 
intricacies in them that I don't understand where those came from, where those restrictions came from, but you can only stream a track, you know, 800,022 times. I'm just making that up, but it's, it might as well be because it's, it's odd to me. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's some rhyme, re, rhyme and uh, reason to it. Um, and like we talked about last time, there might even be restrictions on videos, on the number of videos you can do for, uh, yeah, for that new track that incorporates the beat. Mm -hmm. um, license agreements, I see a lot of these uh, synchronization uh, licenses, for example, are master use agreements. You know, if you've got a song and a production company wants to use that in a, in a new TV series, um, you know, you'll be presented with a, a synchronization license. And, and again, that's a whole session in and of itself. Band agreements, we talked about that. Performance engagement agreements, um, you know, common for lawyers to negotiate and, and, and look at those. And especially nowadays where, you know, the performance might be pre-recorded might be streamed at a later time there's new kinds of clauses that that lawyers really need to work into those agreements at least from my perspective uh depending on the situation and uh, especially if it's going to be a live stream um and and potentially streamed at a later date as well mm. um, artist investment agreements when you know when you got someone who maybe has wants nothing to do with the music business on the one hand but has lots of money and wants to maybe take a risk and high reward you know you might do an artist investment agreement shareholders agreement if you've got an incorporated company we don't need to really get too much into that uh blah blah blah, blah. and i always like to mention this the wu-tang contract with owner of single copy record um i don't know if anyone out there read that book once upon a time in in shaolin um wu-tang did that single copy record which i think somehow ended up in the hands of martin scarelli yeah. um who then <laughs> went to jail and then i think that record was in the possession of the u.s government i don't know but silver rings who produced that i looked him up on instagram a while ago and and he i was chatting with him and i was like dude can i see this contract because he referenced it in the book he's like no man it's way too confidential thanks thanks for uh, asking i just thought it would be a cool kind of agreement to see but just just a weird example that there you know music agreements come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes um that would have been a fun one to work on though i'm i'm sure and Definitely. many many others so maybe I'll leave it at that alex um those are some yeah. things that are very high level but maybe yeah i'll just I'm gonna, yeah we can we can we can look at that i did have a question from uh ingrid ruiz who asked if uh should each member of the band get ilas that was her question yeah that's a really good question um for a band agreement um Yes, uh, for a band agreement, they should get independent legal advice is, uh, is uh, what I think you're alluding to there. Um, in band agreements, there would normally be independent legal advice clauses um, because in that particular scenario, the interests of each party are, are adverse in a way. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you hope the band gets along and I'm sure they do. Um, and it's a weird kind of concept and notion that each individual gets their own lawyers. But in a perfect world, yeah, that's how that should play out. Do do um, um, all Ben me members normally get independent legal advice, even though they've been advised to get legal advice? Um, not always, and so um, maybe I'll just leave that one there. But really good question. Nice. Okay, I'll let you uh, get back to the takeaways. I was really, yeah, no, I, I wanted to, I wanted to say that uh, it's so far. Uh, I know, like we went a little bit over, but I've been really happy with all the information that I've cool. that I've been getting, and I, I really liked uh, some of those those terrifying examples and then kind of recapping with some of the things, reasons why we should get a lawyer. Let's, yeah, we'll let you get back to it and... Um... Yeah, uh, no, um, so, so last slide, um, just just really high level. And I think we've kind of, you know, talked a lot about this. If I had any kind of takeaways in this, this kind of practical type presentation, it's really, you know, um, register your music and understand how music makes money. Um, I think that you know, I've always, and we talked a little bit about this before this session started, but I look at it like a lifelong kind of endeavor. <laughs> um, it's complicated and there are a lot of organizations out there and sometimes you need to beat people over the head with this because, you know, everyone I think needs to be beaten over the head with this because it's complicated and there's a lot out there. So um, read about it, understand it. Um, if you've got a manager, um, uh, you know, your manager should understand it uh, very, very well, but making money in, in, um, in, in music is not what it's all about, but you, you know, but as an artist trying to create a career in the music business, you need to understand that. And so, you know, I um, thoroughly encourage everyone to check out the session number one and two with Stephen Byron, where they talk more about that. Um, we uh, kind of recapped it earlier on in this presentation. Um, 
as you grow your music business, understand when you need to bring in an experienced music entertainment lawyer. Again, I think we've talked a lot about that. And, and really at the end of the day, the earlier you kind of you know create that relationship with an entertainment lawyer, I think the better, at least personally. Um, doesn't mean that you have a file for them, doesn't mean that you're paying them for anything, but better to kind of create those relationships with someone up front um, and before, you know, uh, you know, otherwise maybe at the 11th hour you're scrambling to find someone and, and you know, uh, the individual could be busy and all that kind of stuff. So, so uh, create that relationship. Um, be mindful of music agreement red flags and ask questions. Uh, we talked a lot about that. And those are just some agreement red flags that were raised in this presentation. Um, there's a whole host of other red flags I'm sure we didn't talk about and I'm sure others listening here today can, can create their own list. Um, and lastly, whenever someone uh, else Whenever someone else comes into your musical life, understand one, why they are there, and two, expectations, what they are getting, whether an investor, manager, co-writer, producer, partner, et cetera. And I, again, another item that I think was talked about in some of the last sessions, but um, you know, don't just sign something from a label because it's the first contract that you see. Um, are they the right partner? Who are they? Do you know them? You know, have you had discussions? Have they told you why they like your music? You know, I sometimes tell my clients, um, you know, if a publisher or a label is knocking on your door, you know, ask them why they like you. If they haven't, you know, if they haven't told you, well, maybe that's a good thing to know. Um, and, and so get to know your musical partners and get to know why they want to be a uh, part of your, you know, um, uh, you know, why they want to be part of your musical life, so to speak, um, uh, which, uh, which can then kind of help inform your decision as to whether it's a good fit or not. Because just because someone is maybe providing you with a, with a reasonable looking advance, and yeah. sometimes people won't provide you with an advance, but sometimes just because they are providing you with an advance doesn't mean that you should uh, take that deal. It's all based on the, uh, the context and whether or not it's a good fit. Um, and that's kind of all I had, Alex. Um, yeah, that's hopefully great. folks enjoyed that and took something away from it. Um, again, if folks want to get in touch with me, that's my email address uh, number. Follow me on Instagram. Um, you know, lots of music stuff, some adorable kid stuff, not much. <laughs> um, and if you have any questions about this presentation, even if you want the slides, I'm more than happy to, to, uh, to, to chat with you and uh, provide you with some additional information as you need it. That's been awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for taking the time out to help wrap up this series. Uh, like I, we've been doing this is all November. We've been doing a, a rights management series, and uh, we started off with uh, Stephen Carroll and uh, Byron and Michael from uh, Edwards Creative, and we did that for a couple of weeks. And now we're ending off with uh, Matt Gorman from Ocean Town Music. He's done a great job recapping and kind of giving us some real world scenarios about this. So I'm really happy that we got a chance to do it. Thank you again for, for coming uh, and, and joining us. If you guys want to see the first two sessions, feel free to check out manitobamusic.com slash workshops for all the information um, regarding the first two parts of the rights management series that's been going on every Wednesday for the last three Wednesdays. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, you can reach me at alex at manitobamusic.com. I'm the industry development coordinator and I'm happy to answer any questions, any consults, or even put you in touch with someone like Matt Gorman who can uh, help answer a lot of your questions. So thanks for your lunch hour. We went a little bit over, but it's it was worth it. And uh, if you guys need anything, like I said, check out manitobamusic.com. You can email me, Alex, at Manitoba Music, or you can email Matt at Matt at OceanTownMusic.ca. Okay, guys, have a great afternoon, and thanks again, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it, man. Okay.